Welcome everyone and uh, greetings uh, from the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. Uh, we're very delighted to host today's webinar um, on uh, technology for healthcare in India. Uh, what is the way forward? Um, I have with me uh, two distinguished panelists. Um, it is in a virtual mode, but uh, we will try to make the conversation as interesting as you would have in the physical mode as well. So just to start, the uh, discussion here. I'm going to introduce the two fellow panelists. So my name is Pankaj Setia and with me is Professor uh, Ritu Agrawal and uh, Mr. Girish Krishnamurthy. Uh, for Ritu, you know, I think many of you uh, might have, uh, if you are from the academic community, uh, read her works and um, admired the academic leadership that she has provided. But formally, she is a university professor at the Robert uh, Smith School of Information Systems and uh, at University of Maryland. She's also the founding director of the school's Center for Health Information and Decision Systems. Um, and um, you know, as I mentioned, she has been an academic leader um, for a long period of time. She has published more than 100 papers in academic journals. She's testified before government agencies, such as the US Department of Health. Uh, she has received uh, uh, you know, at University of Maryland major teaching awards. Um, she has been a senior associate dean. Uh, she's currently also associated with the John Hopkins um, University. Um, academically, she has been, uh, you know, like I said, leader. She was the editor in chief of one of the two top journals in the field of information systems. Uh, that is the information systems research. She has published in information systems research, MIS quarterly management science and all the top journals that you would think about um, in our uh, academic discipline. Uh, she has been the National Science Foundation Advanced Professor for Marilyn uh, Smith and has won the, the university's distinguished Scholar Teacher Award. Uh, she was appointed as the Distinguished University Professor, Maryland's highest academic honor. Um, and um, you know she has been a great mentor to many of the younger uh, colleagues um, and professors. And I myself have learned and gained a lot uh, from my discussions with her. So welcome, Ritu, to I am Ahmedabad, and we're looking forward to our discussion um, here with you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Pankaj. Thank you for the kind introduction. I also have with me today uh, somebody who is from the industry side, uh, was very active as the trans one of the transformation leader. He's currently the CEO and managing director of Tata Medical and Diagnostics Limited, Tata MD. Uh, so Girish, uh, uh, very nice to have you. He is the director of Tata Indian Institute of Skills um, uh, and has over three decades of vast and rich experience building enterprises, providing leadership in this domain of technology, healthcare, education, uh, and skill development. Uh, he has worked across geographies um, as a technologist, as an entrepreneur. I know we talked, Girish, uh, earlier about your initiative uh, where you have created this transformative model, the Digital Nerve Center, which has helped provide primary tertiary care uh, to a large parts of rural Karnataka helping over 1.6 million citizens in, in, in that particular geography. Um, Girish was also instrumental to lead the transformation at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, AIMS, uh, the world's largest OPD, and that Digital India initiative was lauded by the Honorable Prime Minister in 2006 as the most successful Digital India initiative. He has done an MBA from UT Dallas, and he's a graduate in electrical engineering and mathematics from University of Madras. He's also authored papers on technology and business strategies. So Girish, uh, welcome to the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. Very nice to have you here. And we are looking forward to our uh, discussions as we go forward. Uh, before we launch the webinar, just for the audience who's here, logged in online, the moment, you know, we will have a series of questions and discussions around things uh, that we think uh, would help us develop a better understanding of the role of technology in healthcare, especially going forward. But if you have questions which are of any type, clarifications, comments, suggestions, ideas, thoughts, 
or just clarification, just put them in the chat box and we will take it at appropriate times. Uh, and we'll keep some time at the end uh, for the questions. Uh, so please, uh, whenever you have the questions or would like some things to be mentioned, please make a note in the chat box and we'll take it uh, at the appropriate time. Um, so in terms of format of today's webinar, what we are going to do is I'm going to ask both Ritu and Girish to do a 10 minute presentation on the topic. And then we will get into the finer details, the questions and um, take it forward in terms of the conversation on the topic. So uh, Ritu, you want to start the discussion? Sure. Um, thank you, Pankaj. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's early in the morning for me, not so early, it's 8.30 a.m. in the United States, but I am truly delighted to be here and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm going to be discussing a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about. As Pankaj said, I've spent the last uh, two decades of my career focusing in on how information technology can be used to improve the practice and delivery of healthcare. So I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes uh, sort of setting the context for our conversation in this webinar. Uh, I'll briefly discuss what I've been doing at the center, but I also want to spend a little bit of time on what I call global healthcare challenges, not specific to India, but in general things that we're dealing with all over the world. And then a few examples of what's going on in the United States uh, that really motivated the work of my center. Now, I recognize that the US and the United, uh, India contexts are different, but I'm going to also argue that many of the issues and problems that we've been facing in the United States are now coming to fore in India as well. So I look at the evolution of health IT the technological innovations that are changing how doctors, patients, and stakeholders envision this new world of healthcare. So I founded the center in 2005, and you, that was a time before health information technology has sort of become big news all over the world. And you can kind of tell by the low resolution of this photograph that it is indeed very old. So we work in three domains. I am not just a pointy head academic. Uh, we work in three domains. We engage very closely with industry to understand what are the problems that medical professionals are facing on the ground. We also interface very closely with policymakers, with government agencies and other major organizations who are responsible for crafting uh, the infrastructure, if you will, that's going to drive this digital transformation forward. So our focus is on not just technology, but also the analytics, the artificial intelligence, the extraction of insights from the data that can help doctors, patients, uh, policymakers make better decisions. So why is healthcare such a critical sector? Uh, I don't think anybody will disagree with the assertion that, you know, the pursuit of health and well-being is just a fundamental goal of humanity, uh, and it is a major policy goal for all nations today. And of course, the pandemic has propelled sort of human health to the forefront of everybody's minds, and I think has vividly revealed for us how fragile our systems are. And that is today, if we look 30 years out, healthcare systems are going to experience even more stress. And I think it's important for all of us to be thinking about these stressors going forward because we are planning today, not just for today, but also for the future. So let me highlight five grand challenges as I see them. And there are of course many more, but I picked the ones that are likely to be most influential in uh, having an impact on almost every nation in the world. First of all, aging of the world's population. Um, the global share of older adults is projected to grow uh, double from 2019 to 2050 from about 703 million to 1.5 billion persons. We all know that older adults pose significant challenges to healthcare systems. Uh, they suffer from a number of diseases and the cost of serving older adults is very high. So this is something we have to be planning for. 
Second one is systemic declines in health. And you know, economic and scientific progress has been somewhat of a double-edged sword. Uh, we have a lot of lifestyle factors and environmental factors, uh, social determinants of health, climate change. As a result, we're seeing a very sharp uptick in chronic diseases the world over. Uh, in India as well, uh, you know, one in every five Indians has a chronic disease. That's 21% of the population. The third grand challenge is the infectious diseases and propagations. Uh, you know, viruses don't recognize borders. Uh, it's been projected that in the next 30 years, we, are all, we will definitely experience another pandemic. And of course, now we have monkeypox coming up. And this is placing a huge demand on medical professionals and the healthcare systems to discover, uh, discover new therapies, but equally be able to provide the kind of surveillance that's needed to predict the next pandemic. Labor scarcity and escalating costs. Uh, healthcare is 10% of world GDP right now and going up every year. And the World Health Organization projects that we will have uh, an amazing shortage of qualified professionals, both doctors as well as nurses going forward. And then finally, health equity. Uh, the ability to provide equal health care to all people, regardless of race, gender, socioeconomic status, caste, whatever the differences might be. So these are grand challenges that we have to be planning for going forward. Now, why did I choose to focus on healthcare? Let me provide some context from India, uh, from, from the United States, so we can look at what's going on in India. Uh, we know that the US has one of the most expensive healthcare systems uh, in the world, but unfortunately, on most important indicators of health, life expectancy being one of them, the US does worse than all other developed nations. We also know that six in 10 US adults have a chronic disease and four in 10 adults have two or more of these chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, again, uh, pose uh, an incredible burden on the healthcare system, both in terms of requiring medical resources as well as cost. Fortunately, many of these chronic diseases can be prevented with improved lifestyle behaviors, such as physical activity, diet, alcohol, uh, reducing alcohol and reducing smoking. So technology has an incredible role and an important role to play here. And at my center for the last two decades, we have been studying three generations of technology. And I think this will provide a very useful backdrop for our discussion today. The first generation of technology, electronic health records, which goes back almost two decades. Uh, in the US today, 96% of all hospitals have electronic health records and over 90% of all physician practices have electronic health records. Now, what do EHR systems get us and what should we be planning for in India? What EHR systems provide for us is this treasure trove of data, this treasure trove of clinical, medical, patient behavior data that we can utilize for making better healthcare decisions, both in practice as well as delivery, and also for clinical discovery, discovering new diseases, discovering new therapies for diseases, et cetera. While all of this is going on in the clinical setting, there's also been a revolution in another dimension of technology, and that is the social media revolution and patient engagement and patient empowerment. We've seen the social media revolution unfold over the last 15 years. Well, what does this have to do with health, health information technology? Social media provides us with a new channel with which to be able to access patients. Social media provides us with new tools that can be in the hands of patients so we can get them engaged in their health and wellness in a way that is absolutely unprecedented. And we only have to look at the growth of health apps. We only have to look at the growth of investment in the mobile healthcare industry to understand how influential this technology can be. The final stream of technological revolution, and this is so exciting because we are poised, I think, at an inflection point in healthcare. This is the resurgence, the growth of artificial intelligence. 
Uh, we started back in 2012 when, of course, you know, deep learning uh, beat all other technologies in image recognition. And now we have uh, technology systems such as TensorFlow and PyTorch and Google and Facebook and everybody's on the bandwagon. I truly think that AI is going to revolutionize healthcare in a way that we've never envisioned or seen before. And we can see it very easily in the Google search trends for the word AI in healthcare. So what does my center do and what is my research focused on um, over the last two and a half decades? We've gone from studying electronic health records, health information exchanges, telemedicine, to patient empowerment, uh, spurred by mobile technologies to AI and machine learning. Now, let's take the opportunity in India. For me, the exciting opportunity, and I think the most transformational opportunity in India is that we are just at the beginning of the digitization curve. And if we look at the Indian healthcare sector, there are at least three aspects of this sector that can benefit in a very rich way from the application of health information technology analytics and AI. This is a, segment, a sector that is largely unorganized and fragmented. So healthcare is delivered through many independent clinics, through government hospitals, through private hospitals, we also have a very large rural population, and unfortunately, 75% of healthcare resources are located in urban areas, whereas 75% of India's population lives in rural areas. So we have an automatic mismatch here, so we need to learn how to leverage technology. And then finally, resource constraints. So all of the technologies that I discussed, EHR systems, mobile apps, artificial intelligence, apply very well to the Indian context. And there are, of course, many developments going on in India that I'm very excited about and eager to learn more and study. Uh, one example is Kushi Baby that some of you might be familiar with that started as a classroom project and is now having a major impact in the state of Rajasthan. They have a range of applications focused on reproductive and maternal health, which is uh, a very important area for focus. And then, of course, the Ayushman Bharat Digital um, Mission, which I think Mr. Uh, Krishnamurti is also going to be talking a lot about. And this is the government's uh, effort to develop a national level health infrastructure. Now, I think where India has strength over the United States and other countries is that we can take these kinds of initiatives and really push them forward. We have experience with national infrastructures like no other country in the world. So let's take this uh, forward. Um, let's uh, get India to take advantage of the digital prowess that we already have. Uh, these national infrastructures are going to provide a very robust foundation, but we do need partnerships between healthcare practitioners, government agencies, and academic institutions, and I hope we can do more of that going forward. So I will stop the um, Pankaj and stop my share. Perfect. Thank you, Ritu, for giving that um, excellent oversight about uh, you know the U.S. healthcare and providing some very nuanced. Uh, perspective on how India uh, can counter its challenges. Uh, Girish, as I said, uh, is, has been based in India since returning uh, since 2004, Girish, if I'm right. Um, yeah. And um, I'm going to ask Girish now to take over and present his views, and then we'll I'll ask a few questions and take uh, some of the questions from the audiences. Thanks, Pangaj. With your permission, I'll just share my screen. Please. You're able to see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I think various people joining on various time zone. And looking at this topic, so for some reason, my slide is not moving. Let me share again.
You want me to share the picture again? Uh, now it is moving, so let me try now. Okay. I'm trying now, Sam. You're able to see my screen now, Pankaj? We can, yeah. So, <clears throat> thanks, Pankaj. Thanks, everyone. And I'm glad to be here. It's extremely exciting time in healthcare. So, when Pankaj put this topic, and basically technology, for healthcare in India, way forward. I feel technology in healthcare itself is a very complex subject. The last 25, 30 years, we have been scrambling what is the real way to go forward. I think Dr. Ritu mentioned about uh, health information exchange and EHR, everything. All of this is going on for the last 30 years. On top of it, Pankaj brought in another most critical and complex subject, healthcare in India. And very interestingly, he brought a three in one in one topic within one hour that he wants to find a solution for way forward. But uh, thanks, Pankaj, very, very uh, innovative of putting together this title. So I'll try to do my justice, what I know and what I've seen in this space for the next 10 minutes or so. See, healthcare in India is uh, very, very different, and which all of us know. And while Dr. Ritu and says there are a few things are very similar, but I'll bring in few concepts, which is to be very important when I'm looking at from India. First of all, everybody is familiar with, we use a ratio called doctor-patient ratio. We call as one is to one, 1800. See, that is true if you are sitting in Ahmedabad or Mumbai or Bangalore or anywhere. But if you go a little away from the city, this ratio starts increasing. And some of the rural India, it goes up to 10 times more than what ratio we see. On top of it, last 30, 40 years, healthcare has assumed to do certain amount of specialization-based care. The specialization-based care is totally make this ratio very, very different. So fundamentally, what I'm trying to drive at it is one of the major characteristics of Indian healthcare. In a rural India, access is the big issue. Access and availability is an issue. Well, we know that, you know, the 75% of the population live in rural India. The second aspect, when you come to urban India, as Ritu mentioned, so there's a huge amount of disease burden on chronic diseases, which I'll address it in coming point. But I also want to bring in from the technology perspective related to healthcare. See, last 25, 30 years, if you really look at it, healthcare innovation, a technology innovation in healthcare, which always assumed to innovate when a patient is with a doctor, either in a clinic or in an operation theater or a procedure room or in a ward. But the two thirds of the world problem and India specific problem, how to get to the doctor, how to get to the right doctor. And also in a healthcare strategic philosophy where healthcare assume if somebody is sick, they will find the care and they will find the doctor. That's a worldwide phenomenon. In that situation, what do we do in healthcare delivery? is the biggest challenge which poses in front of India. And while looking at urban and rural, the public-private healthcare is totally different aspect of the way the care has been provided. And so this is the way I'm thinking some of the major. And also if you look at from the here, technology perspective, data plays a role, which all of us know. See, when information technology is uh, grown, we noticed when by centralizing all the data, we saw a huge improvement in financial services, banking, retail, manufacturing, and rest of the industries. If you apply the same concept in healthcare, it was not working. That's the reason health information exchange could not create a huge impact for a long period. So the reason if you look at a little closer, healthcare data is a little different. It is highly perishable and highly unstructured. Let me qualify what I mean. Five minutes before BP is no longer valid. And more than 85% of the data in healthcare is unstructured. So when I say the digitizing, bringing into a digital format, 
is one of the biggest challenge healthcare process worldwide and it is major challenge in india and ritu mentioned about this uh, chronic diseases lifestyle diseases look at india closely 8 years from now in 2030 we expect 430 million indians is going to be obese obesity is the mother of all chronic diseases and it can get into cardiovascular cancer diabetes hypertension all kinds of problem can obesity can create can you imagine more than one third of india is going to be sick about 8 years from now so it's time to buckle up and act and technology could be the major savior so to summarize the indian healthcare i just want to bring in five attributes see our current care model is episodic in nature one sickness to another sickness one event to another event the way we provision the care is extremely disjointed when i say disjointed every aspect of it it is not continuous coordinated care and most of the care we provide which is reactive today i'm sick i'm going to take medicine or i'm going to see a doctor or the recent time during covid we will do a virtual consultation or a telemedicine and take a consultation and all the process when you look at it when we took this ehr and all these things from the us and the western world what has started happening is the most of the clinical protocol and health science driven processes was most of it is payer driven and provider centric and not necessarily close to patient these are all the five attributes i want to qualify in a strategic manner as the delivery challenge of healthcare so in tata group uh, see while as tcs one of the large it provider we have managed more than 60 70000 hospital beds with an it perspective when our chairman looked at this problem as overall we realized this problem cannot be done like a 500 people 1000 people pilot or doing some poc we can figure it out so we decided to do few large experiments and based on that large experiments we have gained lot of experience and knowledge and wisdom the next 5 minutes are show i just want to share some of that what we gained so we created uh, as pankaj mentioned in the introduction uh, graciously in the beginning we have done like for example in uh, all india institute of medical science uh, 10000 new patients every day they walk into this hospital it used to be like you not know, to see a doctor for 2 minutes sometimes it will take 2 days or sometimes it can even go 10 15 days and from there using a innovative process reimagining the process for healthcare first time challenging the health science driven process and brought in lot of technology we could ensure every patient can see a doctor at least within 2 hours similarly we brought in a digital nerve center concept in a called a model and able to manage about we did about a more than 1 million patients we manage in cancer care see if you look at india india disease burden at an at any time about 600000 cancer patient we treat every year and an active cancer patient is about 3 to 4 million people at any time out of the 200000 patients we closely manage and leveraging deeper digital technology and the primary and secondary care on a public health system which is a very complicated subject we adopted a district near bangalore called kolar which is close to about 1.6 million standard population with about 2 million overall the floating including the overall floating population we also adopted certain district in himachal pradesh like kulu and bilaspur and telangana few district we experimented the prime close to about 1200 services see if you look at healthcare provides about 1350 services overall as per ayushman bharat ayushman bharat about 1200 services happens in primary and secondary all of this different initiative with a very high volume has given us a tremendous amount of knowledge and based on that we have developed a concept called digital model essentially what it is is bridge the gap between access and demand with a digital bridge as i mentioned earlier the current care we provide with the human resources and an infrastructure example a doctor and a clinic or doctors and nurses and everybody with an infrastructure or a technician with a lab that kind of model with this episodic and disjointed and reactive care we added four layer to this one we call as a network it's not just a network of facilities it's a network of every infrastructure including operation theaters equipments everything 
including human resources, any doctor in the world, as well as the practicing doctor in the facility. Second thing, for the first time in the world, we re-looked at every protocol and healthcare clinical process and administrative process, re-imagine and redevelop in the new for the new world. And the third one, which is we are developed a technology platform, which is purely healthcare in the center and healthcare intelligence. And there's something which Dr. Ritu mentioned about uh, clinical support system kind of uh, artificial intelligence models and deeper into that. The fourth component, which is the real uh, change it brings, which is uh, people, we, we call us a digital people, adding a headcount, adding more people and bringing the cost down is a very, very remarkable method of doing it. And this model we implemented in most of this experiment and gain, and which is what we feel nationwide in India, we are trying to work with the government to make it happen. Just to get what is this digital model, how in real, I want to give a quickly two real examples in the world uh, for the audience to uh, get a feel of it so that it would be very interesting discussions uh, during the next available time. So the number one, I wanted to compare the diabetic care in a regular model on a digital model. See, in a regular model, if you take this patient, the right side, I'm showing a barometer, which is we call as a wellness meter. The wellness level of a person, a diabetic patient, this particular patient lives about to, in a rural India. He traveled once 20 kilometers to one of the clinic. At that point of time, he was pronounced or he was identified as a diabetic patient. They started the treatment with medication and certain amount of immediate action. And during the period, over a period, a couple of weeks, he developed some cold and cough and fever. He thought it's a regular cough and fever. So he went to the nearby pharmacy, uh, which is very familiar, very normal in India to go to pharmacy and ask pharmacists to give a medicine. He took the medicine. Since he is uh, diabetic and there are certain uh, difficult composition, and the antibiotic did not match. And he had, within a few weeks, he had a major episode of high blood sugar. He got admitted in the hospital. And then the reactive treatment kept on going and not having a continuous care. Over a period of three, four years, he developed a blood vision and permanently become a diabetic retinopathy patient. It's a real life example. And look at in the right side, the quality of life in a level of five, it has reduced significantly and rest of his life is going to live like that. When you bring a digital model, of course, the first episode is going to happen. And fortunately, if you bring the car close to the car, in this case, you can do a, through our mobile van, we identified a patient. Because the proactive care, you can see that sawtooth curve very sharply cutting up because you're bringing back very quickly because you have an engagement going on. And the next episode of regular cold and fever cannot happen without a doctor consultation because doctor is available for your access. And the third point, which is very important over a period, analyzing all his behavior and overall coach, managing him, the digital platform clearly recommended that this guy has to be looking for his blood vision or diabetic retinopathy very early. So never the diabetic retinopathy was allowed to happen. So on the right side, when you look at it, his wellness level is very, very high. So now this is one angle of high quality care and which is what worldwide everybody is aspiring for. Now this high quality care, whenever I present and talk about it, how much it costs, who is going to provide it, who is going to pay for it. Let's look at it, what happens to the cost. In the first current model, the same patient has to visit a health facility 13 times. In the second model, in the digital model, he has to visit only four times. The first model, 384 kilometers, he has to travel, it is 41 kilometers. The first model, he has to out of packet expenses is about 28,000 rupees. The second model is only 4,400 rupees. He has to get admitted for three days, no admission required because it's a proactive care. He has to spend 15 hours in waiting in health, uh, health facility as an outpatient. You are only four hours because you are already doing pre-planned and most of it comes to close to home patient home. 13 days he could not work. Here he could not work only in five days. So this is the level of technology intervention can bring in if you look at the overall immersive model. I will take you totally from this primary chronic care model 
a proactive continuous coordinated care model on the diabetic patient to a surgical situation we adopted a hospital in southern india a government hospital cancer hospital this hospital used to do about 4000 to 4500 surgery annually but the surgical department has about 51 people working their overall number of hours they work about 140000 hours in a year out of that if you take their opd time and teaching time and all of it the surgical time is about 36000 hours and then are an average they do about 3 hours per surgery that means intuitively they have to do about 12000 surgery annually the reason they could not do it 52% of an oncologist time they spend in non clinical activity 35% of the time they spend only on administrative activity by bringing this digital resources by putting this digital process by overall managing the care in a continuous coordinated manner the efficiency is increased the efficiency is increased by 2.64 times 260% efficiency increase which leads into capacity increase what is the capacity increase without increasing any doctor or infrastructure or any clinical resource by adding few digital resources from 4500 surgeries they could do in the same year about 11900 surgeries of course the added cost of uh, the consumables and other stuff which is required medicines required for the surgery so the one end i showed from the primary and secondary care on a chronic diseases another end on a tertiary care in a hospital how this model really really helped us now based on that we have developed five design principles for way forward healthcare and it is not only for india it is globally applicable number 1 which is continuous care is required number 2 connected care required number 3 proactive care all of this is possible only with a pre planned and deeper technology in play the fourth aspect of course the traditionally the developed model is a payer driven and uh, provider centric model or payer centric and provider driven model has to change into a patient centric model and close to patient and this is the model we learned based on all our experiment and i will stop here and uh, thank you for the opportunity and then we can go forward with the discussion in the panel and q and a thank you so much girish uh, for presenting the the model and and the implications i i am reminded i actually have used the bridge metaphor in an earlier book i wrote in retail as well on on computational bridging and other things so it's very interesting how this was applied in the in the healthcare setting as well uh, but very interesting to hear the the ideas and uh, uh, i think i'm going to start the discussion our, our original idea we have a couple of questions and i'm going to try and see the question that i I had thought of earlier was what are the big challenges uh, and again uh, girish as i had underlined the idea is looking forward i know in the in the technology space a lot of things are challenging but there is also tremendous change and tremendous growth in the technical capabilities and ritu pointed about the advent of ai and one of our uh, listeners here have asked a question i'm going to merge the question there are a lot of challenges and you pointed to a few you have outlined a few challenges in healthcare what are the two or three key things uh, that you think going forward would be solved or would be you know the big important problems that can be solved with the advanced technologies ai being one example of the same uh, what are the two three things that we should think about in the indian context the big indian problems that we can Uh, you know so also the india as a country you know people citizens as, as a as a nation feel much better the bigger chunks of the pie that we can look at and say let's attack these let's counter these with the great technology capability such as that of artificial intelligence that we now at hand so i'll open it to anyone who wants to to take that question to or girish so why don't uh, you let me say let me say a couple of things and then i'll pass it on to girish Uh, you know you asked a big question pankaj there are lots and lots of healthcare challenges so this is certainly not an exhaustive answer 
Uh, but for me, one of the great opportunities that needs to be addressed in India is the scourge of mental health. And we know that uh, the prevalence of mental health has really, uh, mental health uh, issues has really accelerated after the pandemic. And I think the availability of healthcare professionals to handle the mental health scourge is uh, far lower than what needs to uh, be available. So uh, a very good example of where AI can help is in the mental health space. Now we have uh, intelligent chatbots that have shown to, in laboratory settings and in field settings, have shown to be very effective in helping provide mental health services to patients. And mental health is a big taboo in India as well. So I would certainly point that out. The second one is what uh, Girish had already mentioned and I had also alluded to, and that is chronic disease management, right? So getting technology in the hands of patients so that there can be more continuous management, more continuous monitoring, and the delivery of a personalized intervention. You know, don't eat that rasgulla or don't eat that gulab jamun, right? That kind of uh, trigger at the point of patient interaction, patient's daily uh, conditions of daily living, I think can be very effective. And I see good opportunity for AI there. Girish, do you have, want to comment on that? Absolutely. So thanks, Ritu. It's a very important point. So, see, let us uh, see the technology. First of all, let's look at the technology which is highly required for healthcare. Then come into I'll come into how the AI plays an important role. As I mentioned earlier, the healthcare data is highly unstructured data. Uh, thanks to a lot of technology development in the last 10 years. See, the way we are able to relate to imaging today was very, very different 10 years before. Any image can be interpre interpreted in a right manner today. The technology is available. And any communication can be brought into a digitized structured data model, even if it is unstructured. Just to give an example, similar diseases, kind of a same diagnosis and prognosis, same prescription, but the communication of the doctor to the individual patients are very different. These kind of a subtle differences healthcare poses. So ability to catch this data is the first technology intervention is necessary for India. Because to AI to play a role, not just an EHR standardized data, which is given by FHIR standard, ICD-10 and ACC and HIPAR are similar what we are doing in India and all of it is fine. But that is gives you certain amounts of hygiene. The most critical point is how are we going to class this, catch, capture this data? Now, let me give you a little more detail what I mean by this data important. Every health professional, every senior physician in whatever specialization they're practicing, all of them are clear about the care plan, protocol, care pathways. But it becomes a very static model based on their medical practices. But the biggest difference patient to patient on the ground, it is going to come on the data. The data could be a parameter or a diagnostic test results or a physical consultation or a physical examination, whatever way the, all this data is coming in. I'll just give you a simple veracity of this data variation. Now, if you look at in obesity, it is close to about 1600 different attributes has to be considered. If you take diabetes, about 1300 attributes has to be considered and at least minimum about 70 to 80 data point has to be considered before you give a treatment. In oncology, it's very complicated. It is about 3300 data points. Now, the ability to capture these indicators or attributes into the system gives you a phenomenal power for AI to act. So my suggestion is to to clearly scale the technology development which has happened in last 10, 12 years is highly relevant for healthcare. It is time to act and the ability to capture this data is critical. India is in a, a right vantage point to really implement this system. I certainly believe that the new Digital India Health Mission and the various digital transformation which are looking at healthcare will pay way to collect this data. 
I think some some very excellent points, and I think the listeners have posted some questions. I'm going to combine a few of them, which seem to be relevant. So one, you know, this whole idea of getting the data and then putting it into a system. Uh, a lot of people here in the audience are uh, mentioning different aspects that they see challenging, and you know, it'll be nice to hear your views on it. One of the things that uh, people are pointing here is, uh, how do you get it to, uh, you know, don't we need to get deeper into the data? And more importantly, algorithms to make sure that there are no biases that are uh, you know, perpetuated by the algorithms, biases due to skill, knowledge, machine idiosyncrasies, algorithmic that is, and so on. Uh, the other related question people are saying is related to, uh, you know, the, the privacy issues. Uh, how do we make these technologies that leverage very intricate and um, individual specific data, which might be of a very private nature and uh, how do we make policies around it? How do we develop research? What are the issues that need to be thought about before we leverage this data through you know, this vast technology capability? So standardization, uh, getting deep dive, scaling this whole thing up into a system while maintaining the privacy and not per, uh, you know, perpetuating any biases in, in the decision. I can go first on this uh, if retrieved is okay. Go ahead. See, uh, let me first address this uh, data privacy or data related uh, question from you, Pankaj. See, let us have a fundamental uh, necessity of a data for a care provider. If you're somebody is going to give a permission to access your financial data, it's a complicated one, nobody wants to share. That is the right way we evolved over a period in the modern society. Whereas to any patient, if their care provider or a doctor, they will not hesitate to share the data with them because it is their well-being. It is very clearly driven. So my view is it's a very, very different paradigm when you come to the data privacy and the personal data, individual data, how we need to manage. Currently, the recent times in India, I'm speaking for India, uh, because that is the main focus. See, currently there are a lot of data, data privacy act has been uh, enacted and then there are certain guidelines has been given. Most of it, it is considered with the consent, right? It is today the healthcare consent related legal framework for data, which is it is like how you uh, accept for cookies in your app because under necessity, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to accept your, I'm going to consent for surgeries to data access to data privacy situation. But we need to really do on the opposite side. See, whenever we hire a lawyer, we give the power to the lawyer to represent you. We need to really mature our legal framework this is my view. This is an individual independent view. The healthcare delivery thought process has to view the health professionals and the doctors are really a partner and helping the patient to really, really have a, their well-being. To do that, the legal framework, we need to really evolve. So this is my view on the data privacy piece. Then the data security, which you mentioned, which is very different problem here. The different problem in data security here, which we always assume that data security on a digitization manner, somebody is going to give the data to somebody and then they are going to really manage it happen. But the problem what is happening in India is opposite. Getting the data out of an IT system to a centralized model is a huge challenge and we've never been successful. Of course, some of the Western world, they're able to really necessitate it with the EHR and HIE standards and then bring it in. But in India, we have not been successful. I have seen only once we have become very successful in collecting data, where government has mandated during COVID for every lab and every practitioner to share the data to ICMR. Otherwise, the data sharing and then uh, from 2005, we have been watching how the repositories are created, uh, the registries are created, which is not very successful. So, 
for me if you are able to create a proper data security technology is available again data security framework for data sharing and ensure that every it system should be following that security protocol and accessing this kind of an api uh, is very critical and which we have done in upi we have done in most of the financial data today from the government side and we should bring the same practice over here i believe our digital health mission is following the same standard i completely agree with you girish about upi i think through both upi and aadhaar we've shown that we can build these national level infrastructures and the same needs to be done for health data as well uh, i also you know want to underscore the importance of privacy i think that's a challenge that governments all over the world are dealing with when it comes to health data and the legislation is lagging uh, not just in india but in every other country in the world as well i will say that technologies such as blockchain provide some promising opportunities for you know implementing more um, privacy if you will in 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 healthcare data also want to make one comment about pankaj's uh, question related to equity health equity and fairness uh, i think that's um, uh, a risk that we all have to be very vigilant to as more and more healthcare becomes digitized that we don't end up automating uh, any kinds of biases that we might already have present in clinical decision making uh, and i'm excited to see the you know the a field of research related to fairness and ethics in ai applications i do think that we will have international standards very soon that say how should we be auditing ai applications and especially in the context of healthcare because that's where one worries most about uh, individual biases creeping into decision making so i think that's a space to be watched Thank you, thank you for the comments. This is great. I'm going to go through some of the questions. I know we are running out of time, and I, I'm going to suspend some of my questions to see what people are saying. One of the things that I'm uh, reading is a lot of people are saying is how can we help the rural areas? And uh, there are comments related to Ashang and Wadi workers, frontline staff working, uh, how they respond through the technology induction. And um, Girish, I'm going to take the liberty to say that your digital health center actually relied on a lot of public care workers and existing healthcare system to use technology to complement and largely focused on making the connect with the people who otherwise have um, don't have direct access due to the lack of their uh, you know, abilities, confidence, anxiety, or whatever else may be that they are not included, so they're excluded from the system and. the system brought some of it back but i want to pick one of the questions that i think is very important and some people are asking that here is ritu you talked about this bias and uh, equity one of the biggest equity or lack of equity that happens is because of the uh, indian uh, system being all out of pocket people who cannot afford care uh, because they have to pay it from their own pocket sometimes do not get access to quality care and and the whole model of healthcare and i know we are transforming with more insurance being brought in and others what do you think uh, both of you in terms of technology's role in shaping the new model which is more just and fair because it incorporates or offers great care uh, with less sensitivity at least if not no sensitivity to a person's financial capability if you any thoughts on that please go ahead girish uh, why did you share your perspective on that yeah. so the idea is can we can we help the poorest of the poor get the best of the care uh, through digital technologies making it possible to some extent or do, does our model of care delivery and public systems need to See, transform I, i would rather take one minute explain what we have done rather than uh, see it has to be done there is no doubt right whether to do for the the equity for equitable healthcare there is no doubt as a as a citizen of this world every human being is entitled for the best health care because that is the most important virtue or the necessity we need to have as a life as a human being so there's no doubt philosophically that we have to provide best health care for everybody but how do we make it happen and how it is practically possible is the question we made an attempt to do this in the poor of the poor how it can be done because it has to be done in public health system i will tell you an empirical formula pankaj see what we noticed on our experience 1 to 1.25% of any population is the healthcare load requires care in a day 
So any point of time, if we say 1.5, if we take a district 1% to 1.25% of the population will be sick on a day. If you take a city, it is same. If you take a country, it is same. Now that is your load, like a power sector, how do you define the load? Now, when you look at in rural India, what is happening is about 20%, 25% of them, they go into a tertiary care because lack of access to that. So they're very sick, so they have to go. Then there is about, about 10 to 15%, they go to regular healthcare. So for example, if you take a 2 million population, a 20 lakh population, that this 1% comes to a number and about four 5,000, they go to primary care every day from district hospital to the primary care centers. Then another four 5,000, they go to a private care or whomever their local uh, doctor, whether he's certified or not certified, who can help him. Pharmacist type of stuff. But around 25 to 30% of the people, they don't go to the care at all. For various reasons, they are not served or underserved. So this is a fundamental problem. If you really look at it, and in India, about 30 to 33% are the below poverty line people requires care and they have to be addressed. And they cannot afford for any care. Even if you want to charge about 100 rupees, 50 rupees, 10 rupees, they will not be able to afford. This is the state. And the government of India is provisioning enough money for this purpose. But how do we really make the biggest problem is 40 to 50% of the people, they don't even know how to seek freely given public health system. So the most important point which we need to, what we experience is using technology, we made people to come to health facility. And we made the people to come to health facility in a planned manner so that the health facility is not getting overwhelmed. Once they come in, we use technology to ensure the care is available. So once they had the confidence that when I go to a primary health center or a sub-center or a wellness center or a district hospital or a block hospital, there is somebody to take care of you. We started seeing the volume increase. And today, whatever experience, 60% of the district are willing to take a public health system where we are operating four or five years before it's not that so. So my view is the equitable healthcare is one word which I want to leave it to the audience. We need to be in a position to instill confidence that we will be in a position to provide care. Then technology is the only thing which can do. Then automatically the equitable care increases. I will stop it here. Yeah, I think we need um, a, a dual push, if you will. You know, what is the value proposition of technology? It allows you to replicate, distribute expertise at a lower cost. You can get technology in the hands of the, of the individuals in rural areas. Um, unfortunately, as you pointed out, Girish, the digital literacy in these areas tends to be low. So we need, uh, you know, a squad of people on the ground as well to distribute out this knowledge about and confidence about how technology can help people manage their own health. And once they start building that, I think the word of mouth um, diffusion through rural India is likely to be the most effective. And we've seen that with so many other things, right? So we've, you know, we've seen it with um, uh, financial services. We've seen it with so many people who were unbanked who are now able to engage in digital financial transactions. And we can envision a similar future for healthcare as well. It will take time. It will take time and there'll be lots of roadblocks, but we can definitely be planning for that uh, greater distribution, greater equity and greater fairness for access to healthcare resources. I agree with you. Excellent discussion. I'm sorry we are running out of time. I tried to take as many questions as I could, but I want to end this webinar at this point and maybe give you a last word to both of the panelists here. Uh, just anything you want to suggest uh, or a word of advice for startups or professionals in this domain in terms of skills they should build or solutions they should think about building uh, to address this healthcare uh, or, or, or to capture the opportunity I, I like to think of that technology offers uh, to solve many of our challenges. Anything for our 
students, professionals, or startup entrepreneurs, what should they think of in terms of skills to gain or solutions to build? So I saw a question in the chat. Uh, I saw a question in the chat related to wearables. So I'll use that example. Uh, you know, we've talked about the episodic nature of healthcare and the uh, fact that you see a doctor once in six months or once in a year if you're lucky. And then in between those episodes, all kinds of things can happen to your health. So this notion of continuous engagement of patients, uh, I think uh, mobile technologies, wearable technologies are likely to be highly effective and influential in empowering patients to engage in more preventive care rather than curative care and to prevent disease before it occurs. And this can happen even in rural settings, this can happen even in low digital literacy settings. So that will be my business opportunity, if you will. Thank you, Dr. So uh, given the interest time, I will be very quick, Pankaj, about this. Uh, see, uh, I've been watching the startup world for the last six, seven years in healthcare field. A lot of very interesting uh, technology and solutions are evolving. And the word of caution about healthcare as an industry. And healthcare is not, cannot be considered a problem of a economic alone. And the valuation, the private equity model, that is not in my personal opinion is we cannot replicate what we saw, other innovation and other things the startup world saw in the last 15, 20 years into this. So here is a long-term game and we need to have solutions which is sustainable. And it is not a model where I got enough subscription and subscribers because of that it is a successful model. Here the impact and scalability and sustainability brings in. And healthcare per se, we have seen when the privatized healthcare in India happened in the last 30, 40 years, the, how the cost of care has increased tremendously because of the payer-driven economy in the Western world. And in India, the cost of care is becoming very, very different in a corporate and private health. And me being a private care provider, I'm speaking. So we had to be extremely careful unless we break this jinx so the startup has an ability to solve this problem. My view is startup to look at it, uh, not a very high EBITDA oriented business. Looking at a high value oriented business, not a valuation oriented business. In the long term, because we have 1.4, 1.5 billion population, everybody requires health. So we don't need to hold everybody as their customer forever to ensure that for your profitability. And automatically we have a large demand available. One business in India has never seen reduced demand, which is healthcare business. I've not seen in my life any pharmacy closed in, nine, in any neighborhood pharmacy closed. So nobody goes out of business in healthcare. So patience is the game for startup. And I feel we have to approach it this way in healthcare. Perfect. Thank you so much for the comments. I'll just uh, highlight that thing, Girish, that you mentioned many years ago. One of my friends working at Amazon, I asked him, uh, why don't you think about profits? And this was a time when people were criticizing Amazon's model a lot because they said it's not profitable. Uh, where are they going to get money? They have very high fees and all that. And I remember the thing he told me, it just stuck with me. Uh, and he said, uh, well, why should we care about profits? We are changing the world. And, and I think that's very telling uh, in terms of, I know there is a capitalistic model, there is a valuation, there is money and all that. But I've always told students as uh, you know, to think about what you do is really something that is core value. Uh, and I think Grish, you put it very nicely, a value, not valuation. But I think that, that probably is more true in healthcare uh, than any place, because if you have the ability to serve uh, so many people who uh, think healthcare, uh, who actually do not get something that they sh should, uh, as, as a right, uh, it is really a great opportunity to create value for a large country like India and serve the larger populace. So with that, I, I want to thank the panelists here on behalf of everybody. Thank you for uh, coming uh, and taking the time to talk with us at Center for Digital Transformation at Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. Uh, we hope people have learned and there are a lot of questions. Sorry, we couldn't take many of them. I've tried to pick as many as I could in terms of themes and address it. 
Uh, but um, appreciate you, uh, Ritu, uh, for joining us early morning and Girish for taking the time after the end of the hectic day. Uh, thank you both. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going. You can write to us at the CDTA Center. We would love to host anything or any other topics that you think would be valuable to discuss in the future. So thank you again, Girish. Thank you, Ritu. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.